Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and this video is kind of an introductory video to uh, some of James Hansen's uh, recent work, including the paper uh, Global Warming in the Pipeline. So just uh, about a week ago, less than a week ago, an updated version of this uh, paper came online. It's accessible to everybody. It's open source. It's called Global Warming in the Pipeline. Hansen is the lead author, and there's, um, I don't know, about 14, 15 other offers and authors. And this is a very significant paper. The latest updated version is 62 pages. Now, a version was released online uh, late last year, early this year, early 2023, that was 48 pages. But people, anybody can go and look at it and make comments, and then they update it and improve it. And the main difference between the 62-page um, paper, which just came out, the updated version, and the previous one, the 48-pager, is that the, the whole Cenozoic, uh, the period from now to 66 million years ago is examined and from this you can get more a better handle on things like equilibrium climate sensitivity etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, what this video is going to do is talk about the um, notes that have been put online by Hansen since the release of the initial version and a little bit of the background on uh, what the paper is, you know, sort of a high-end summary of, of some of the things that the paper is saying and some of the controversy that the paper's already caused. Um, so that's the gist of this video. Um, I just finished this excellent uh, non-fiction, or sorry, fiction book by John Grissom called Grey Mountain. And it was written, I think it was written, well, it was published in 2014 is the copyright. So, you know, it's not that old a book. Um, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because it takes place in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and it's all about uh, mountaintop removal, which is, which is a real thing that's been going on for years not many people know about it. So all of the mining in that region used to be deep mines. You know, you'd, you'd um, have a mine entrance fairly small and you'd uh, have a very extensive labyrinth of underground passageways and you'd attack the coal seams and bring up the coal from them. And then they decided, well, why do we need to do this? You know, so what's been happening is, you know, mountains, you know, maybe 4,000, four and a half thousand feet high, right? They're part of the Appalachians. The Appalachians is a very, very old mountain range. It was the height of the Himalayas, but erosion over millions of years has withered it down to its present height. Of course, it's covered by topsoils and by trees, mostly deciduous trees. And there's, you know, it's very, very beautiful land, rivers running through it, you know, all kinds of uh, wildlife and uh, a lot of these mountains have been owned by um, long-standing families in the region. And when the um, owners die, uh, die, they leave the mountains, they leave the, leave the acreage to their children. And often there's maybe five or six kids involved. And these kids are forever arguing, do we keep it? Do we sell it? So a lot of these just get sold off and they get sold to coal companies. The coal companies then um, uh, make roads up to the top of the mountain. They use bulldozers to push all of the trees and the soils off of the sides of the mountain to expose the granite, the bedrock. Then they drill holes in the bedrock and they blow it to smithereens and they remove the top parts of the mountain until they get down to a coal seam. Then all of the uh, tractors and heavy equipment removal scrape off the coal from the coal seam. They um, wash it or rinse it with water, and that water residue is a very toxic slurry. 
which is also pushed down, the, ends up going down the sides of the mountain. Once they've uh, depleted uh, the coal seam, they repeat the process of blasting the granite, um, dynamiting the granite into small chunks, pushing those off of the mountain and uh, reaching the next coal seam and extracting all of the coal from that seam and working their way down. So what used to be a 4,000 foot mountain, uh, you know, by the time they go through about, you know, six or seven or eight or 10 coal seams on the way down, extracting huge amounts of coal, all of the, um, everything else is just pushed off the side of the mountain. So not only is the mountain top removed, you know, say the top uh, thousand feet of a 4,000 foot mountain, but all of the waste, all of the, all of the stuff is pushed down the edges and filling up the valleys around the mountain, blocking streams, etc. So you can imagine, you know, the environmental impacts of this. It's, it's just horrendous. You know, the water uh, that is used to wash the coal is contaminated after with all kinds of contaminants and there's many, many cancer clusters in the regions for people that live there. And uh, yeah, the, the coal companies have, have ultimate power over, over, over um, what happens there. And they have control of the government and regulations, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there you have it, mountaintop removal. Um, if you want to read a fiction to find out a lot about it, like I said, Grey Mountain by John Grissom is an excellent read. And I'll do further videos on this coal top, uh, mountaintop removal. Uh, I just wanted to, to mention that. Okay, so getting back to global warming in the pipeline, you know, very significant uh, paper by James Hansen. I've been looking forward to his book, uh, which is supposed to be coming out soon um called uh i think hopefully my sound is okay and my sound is coming in and out testing 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 yeah okay i think you can hear me okay so global warming in the pipeline 62 pages uh this version has just come out um i believe on may 19th the previous version uh, 48 pages, doesn't have much on the Cenozoic, so it's a, it's a great improvement, the new version. So let's go back to when the paper originally came out. Okay, so, so here we have it. Uh, so this was um, an article December 26, 2022, when the first version uh, came out of global warming in the pipeline. So there was an article in Daily Kos, James Hansen, there's a lot more warming in the pipeline. This is a good picture of, of James Hansen. Uh, in 1988, that's uh, 35, 36 years ago when he was warning Congress about climate change. Okay. Um, okay, so Hansen and 14 co-authors, they released a preprint called Global Warming in the Pipeline. It's an important paper. It makes a number of key points, but the bottom line is that we must act immediately to address the climate crisis. So Hansen uses the framing, human-made geoengineering of Earth's climate must be rapidly phased out. Okay, so he uses that phrase to call for emissions elimination but also for carbon dioxide removal and for solar radiation management. So remember back ages ago when I was talking about the three-legged bar stool, saying we have to slash fossil fuel emissions, we need to deploy carbon dioxide removal, and we also need to deploy solar radiation management. So this is exactly what Hansen is saying now. You know, it's a summary of this extensive paper. So here are some of the key points. The Earth climate sensitivity is the Earth's short-term response to a CO2 doubling. It's higher than previously assumed. So that's a doubling from 280 to 560 parts per million. Most scientists have said it was a, it's about 3 degrees Celsius. But Hansen et al. 
in these papers now say it's four Celsius or more, and that's based on paleoclimate data. It's based on data, it's not based on modeling, which is what the IPCC and many, many other people are using. The, it, this, this is the actual data in the past. So this means that there's more warming in the pipeline than previously assumed. Okay, in the pipeline so is, is a metaphor for in the future, okay? Just in case you want to clear up any, any misconceptions on that. So while humans have increased atmospheric CO2 by 50% since the Industrial Revolution, right? So it was 280, half of that is 140, 280 plus 140 is 420. So that's where we're at now. If you include all of the additional greenhouse gases, the methane, the nitrous oxide, the actual climate forcing is four watts per square meter. This is equivalent to a doubling of CO2. Okay, so if you don't include all the other greenhouse gases, we're already there at this doubling of CO2. So we're talking about CO2 equivalent, um, which is now about 560 parts per million. So CO2 itself is 420 odd. If you include all the other greenhouse gases and the global warming potentials, etc., you get CO2E at 560. So that's equivalent to a doubling of CO2. Now, another key factor is that part of the current warming is being hidden by human-made particulate air pollution by aerosols, mainly sulfur-based aerosols. So North America and Europe started to reduce emissions of aerosols of sulfur after the introduction of Clean Air Acts in the 1970s. Um, so the regional and global warming has become more pronounced as a result of this of, of having less aerosols. In the past decades, the last 10 years, 20 years, China and global shipping has slashed sulfur emissions using cleaner fuels and sulfur filter systems called scrubbers. So there's clear signals from ground, ocean, and satellite-based observations that the rate of global warming has recently doubled. So this needs to be taken into account in risk assessments. By recently, since 2010, basically, doubled. Okay, this is huge. Assuming today's forcing four watts per square meter stabilizes and human-made aerosols are eliminated when all feedbacks, including the long-term feedback, so we've got uh, rapid feedbacks or short-term feedbacks, we've got ultra-fast feedbacks, and we've got long-term feedbacks. If you include the long-term feedbacks, if everything plays out, we're on track for about 10 degrees Celsius of warming with this four watts per square meter forcing. And that 10 degrees Celsius, if aerosol stayed at today's levels, we wouldn't see the 10. It says we'd see more like six or seven, but in the paper, it actually says closer to eight. Okay, this is a scenario. We still control our future, but we're on track at the moment to increase climate forcing even more than this four watts per square meter, making these levels even higher. Okay, this is this is the this is based on paleo uh, data. If greenhouse gas forcing keeps growing at the current rate, it could match the level of the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum mass extinction within a century. Okay, we're increasing climate forcing twenty times faster than in the Paleo Eocene. Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. So long-term feedbacks won't take as long as in the paleo record to get these warm temperatures, okay? So, you know, we're off the charts in terms of our rate of change of warming. And the paper uh, concludes that we must implement a carbon fee and border duty, so fee and dividend, uh, to slash emissions and not just... Uh, emissions in one country, but emissions around the world. Human-made geoengineering of Earth's climate must be rapidly phased out by what he means is that we're, we're doing this human-made geoengineering by emitting greenhouse gases. So we have to stop emitting greenhouse gases. We have to do carbon dioxide removal, i.e. remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And we have to implement research and implement safe solar radiation management, SRM, to counter 
the massive fossil fuel emissions geoengine exper experiment that we are currently running. So this is turning things around. Instead of saying that we've got to do geoengineering, like carbon dioxide removal and SRM, solar radiation management, we've got to stop the fossil fuel emissions, that geoengineering experiment, and return the Earth to a safe state. And to do this, we must improve international cooperation to allow the developing world to grow using clean energy. Okay, um, now I'm guessing that, you know, a huge paper was written, you know, 100 page paper maybe or more, um, and it's been split into two. So there's going to be a companion paper coming out that addresses the near term shutdown of the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation Current, and the associated multimeter sea level rise on a century time scale. So, you know, there's going to be a paper coming out very soon, which is probably called Global Sea Level Rise in the Pipeline, something like that. Um, it'll be a companion paper to, to, to this paper. And then, um, you know, those are things that have kept the release date of the new book that Hansen's working on called Sophie's Planet. Um, it has, you know, it keeps being delayed its release because of, of these, you know, work, this work in all these papers. And you can see why. I mean, these papers are massive undertakings. Okay, so this is Hansen's uh, website at Columbia University. Um, so Hansen Climate Science Awareness and Solutions Program these are his family members. Here, there he is right here with his trademark uh, Gilligan's hat. Um, and he's had recent communications here, and I'll go briefly over these. These are done. So this is when the paper Global Warming in the Pipeline was first put on the physics uh, server site. And there's been articles since. Uh, and, and these are fairly short, so I, I think it's worth going into them to get you an idea of his thinking. And he's got previous work here, some uh, publications. This is his previous book, Storms of My Grandchildren, which was an excellent, excellent book. It was a really good book. So I'm hoping uh, Sophie's Planet, Sophie is one of his grandkids, is going to be equally good. I'm sure that the publishers are, are putting the thumbscrews in, saying, you know, we need the, we need the, 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 the we need the manuscript because we promised people, you know, a release date for this new book. Um, they probably pushed at him to change the title from Sophie's Planet to something, you know, uh, that, you know, <laughs> something different that is easier for people to understand that it's, a, you know, that it's an update like storms, more storms of my grandchildren or even bigger storms of my grandchildren. I'd like to, see, you know, I'd rather see a title like that. I think it would get much greater publication. But anyway, so let's, I'm going to show you some of these uh, recent communications. Um, and uh, there's basically five of them. So I'm going to go over them for the rest of this video. And then um, in, in, in next video and subsequent ones after that, I'm going to talk about the uh, 60, the, 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 the full version, the 62 page version, version <laughs> Of, of his paper because it's very very important so I want to cover it okay so uh, so this is the um, okay so this is uh, the the communication so Earth's energy imbalance in watts per square meter and this is uh, the 12 month running mean from 2000 to now this is the key metric right because if this is zero the planet's not warming if it's above zero the planet's warming so, you know, if you take a mean here, it was about 0.6 10 years ago. Take a mean now, it's doubled in the last decade. That's really crazy stuff. The re there's year-to-year -year variation because there's ultra-fast feedbacks with clouds, etc. But clouds are the main reason why there's year-to-year -year fluctuation. Okay, so let's see what he said about it shortly after they released the... Um, the global warming in the pipeline paper. Okay, first of all, so they submitted it. Um, there's a link to it here. So part of it is they've got the Earth energy imbalance, which is a which is very key here. Um, and then this is the mean, um, the recent mean, 1.22. 
watts per square meter and a mean, a longer term mean, um, slightly less. And if you go back even just even a decade, you know, the mean was it was more like 0 0.6. So it, it's doubled, basically. Um, okay, so Earth energy imbalance, EEI, it's a net gain or loss of energy by the planet. I, the, it's the difference between the absorbed solar energy and the emitted thermal, which is heat radiation. So it's a basic diagnostic informing us where global climate is headed. As long as more energy is coming in than is going out, as long as EEI is positive, the Earth will continue to get hotter. The more positive it is, the, the hotter, the quicker the rate of heating. So it's hard to measure the Earth energy imbalance because it's a small difference between two large quantities. So Earth absorbs and emits it's about 240 watts per square meter averaged over the entire planetary surface. So we're looking at a change of, of uh, you know, much less than a percent. You know, an increase of 1.22 here is just a small fraction. You know, uh, it's a small fraction, what, uh, half a percent or something. Um, you know, uh, well, what 1% would be uh, 100, so it would be 2.4, uh, right? So, yeah, half a percent or something. Okay, so we're looking at a difference between two large quantities. So the air is t high and it's tough to get at it, but the change of EEI is well measured from space. So absolute calibration is obtained from a change of heat in the heat reservoirs mainly the global oceans over a period of at least a decade to reduce the error due to the finite number of places that the ocean is sampled so it does vary from year to year as you can see in the figure okay um largely because global cloud amount varies with weather and ocean dynamics but average over several years it tells us what what is needed to stabilize climate Okay, so about 10 years ago, EEI was about 0 0.6 watts per square meter. Um, that doesn't sound like much, but it equals the energy. You may have heard this in 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs every day, per day, every day. Okay, now it appears that EEI has, a most, has approximately doubled to more than 1 watts per square meter, right? It's 1.22. So that's 800,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs per day now, okay? Per day, every day. That's the amount of heating energy that's going into the climate system, okay? And that's because of the increased rate of greenhouse gases and also the reduction of human-made aerosols, which are the fine particles in the air that reflect sunlight and cool the planet. Okay, so... Failure of governments to take actions required to stabilize climate is due in part to climate's delayed response, right? If the full equilibrium climate impact of fossil fuel burning occurred immediately, we, we, you know, we'd be much warmer now and governments would have had to have taken action. But on the other hand, the delayed response is useful because if we use the time wisely, we can actually re reduce it. So it's good to understand what it is the response time and you know that these studies have been going on a long time i mean the charney study in 1979 looked at the equilibrium climate sensitivity to a co2 doubling um and it uh it got just included fast feedbacks like water vapor clouds and sea ice and the fat it was basically three degrees celsius um, but the capacity of the ocean to absorb heat um, was very important, okay? Um, and the delay is a strong function of the equilibrium climate sensitivity. So most fast feedbacks come into play not in response to the climate forcing, but in response to global temperature change, okay? So uh, basically the delay increases linear with the equilibrium climate sensitivity. So the delay to, for the warming to be realized is twice as long if it, ACS is four degrees as opposed to if it's two degrees. Okay, um, so the, uh, you know, how much heat diffuses into the ocean is a key uh, 
factor that has a big impact on on the delay and also on the ECS. So, you know, atmosphere ocean GCMs can provide a, a more reliable climate response time if they realistically simulate ocean dynamics and mixing. But the mixing um, in the models is too efficient. Okay, in a hundred years, global surface temperature achieved only 60% of its equilibrium response. Okay, so the different models, um, all the different computer models had a response time as slower, slower than the Goddard Institute of Space Science, GCM. So they, they you know, the matter wasn't resolved, but aerosols are equally important. And, um, you know, if you, if you assume more heat's going into the ocean, you can assume the aerosols aren't having, are having less of an impact and so on. But we're measuring and finding out much more about aerosol effects because of the phasing out of the, of the sulfur from the fuels of ships and also what China is doing. Okay, so, uh, you know, those issues are becoming more and more resolved um, and they're being addressed in this pipeline paper. So I'll look at the details that are in there. So here's some, couple, some key figures. This is global mean surface temperature response to an instant CO2 doubling. Okay, so if you double CO2 instantly, then this is what you'd expect from the, the GI, the Goddard Institute of Space Science, GCM, and the, 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 mod, the original model and the updated model, which is much more accurate and the num values are higher. And this is the temperature response function um, to respond. E, one over E is the E folding time. So this is, you know, it, you know it's showing, showing like a hundred years here for the CO2, the warming. So that, you know, when you, when you double the CO2, it takes a hundred years for the system to respond according to this model. Um, and, uh, yeah, it goes into some more details here. This is the Earth energy imbalance. Um, you know, uh, Earth energy imbalance for doubling of CO2 and the response function so plotted here. And what you can see is, uh, you know, when there's a large Earth energy imbalance, it, it, it uh, reduces quite quickly because of other, because of cloud effects and feedback effects. Okay, so the cloud physics community is aware of the quick cloud response to radiative forcing. And this is where we can talk about some of these ultra fast uh, forcings, ultra fast feedbacks. So, but what, what uh, the new MOT study shows is the earth energy imbalance reaches 63% response, return toward equilibrium in only 10 years. Okay, uh, which is, which is uh, basically, you know, in only 10 years, that's the red line here, rather than taking, you know, up to here, which I guess is, this is 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So it looks like it's about 30, 30 years here. Now it's only 10 years. So the response is much quicker. Okay. And this is because we're getting a better handle on the aerosols. This fast response of EEI decreases energy flux into the ocean. Is it realistic? Um, the EEI response time from 10 years in the latest GISS uh, modeling to 50 years in the GIS 2014 depends on the division of, it, it's cloud physics, the cloud particles, water and ice, um, cloud microphysics, Okay, so all of this stuff is, um, so the earth energy imbalance is key. All of this stuff, it, it's the single most important diagnostic quantity characterizing the status of climate change, the prospects for continued global warming, stabilization of global temperature or cooling of the planet. There's a large natural variability on timescales of a few years because clouds are sensitive to fluctuations of weather patterns and ocean dynamics. Okay, it's increased in the past decade. And the projection is that global warming will accelerate by as much as 50 to 100% in the few decades following 2010.
accelerated warming, okay, because of this earth energy imbalance increase. Okay, so, so that's basically the, this is getting larger and larger, so climate change is accelerating more and more. So he has a few words here about, uh, okay, so yeah, he talks about the UN, United Nations Conference of Parties. These are the yearly meetings. I've gone to a number. Uh, they give the impression that much progress is being made and it's still feasible to limit global warming to as little as 1.5 Celsius, they say. And, you know, this is just, this, this is uh, just ridiculous. Okay. Um, and uh, so here's, here's the temperature anomaly um, relative to the 1880 to 1920 mean. You can see the super El Ninos here. You can see the best linear fit from 1970 to 2015 is 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade. Here's what we're seeing, you know, because of a number of different factors, including the reduction of aerosols. We're seeing accelerated warming. We're on an accelerated warming path that's more like 0.28 degrees Celsius per decade. Okay, that's the reality. Um, he talks about um, the reasons why. Um, this is interesting. T Twitter world science. We've been told that a bizarre criticism of the pipeline paper appeared on Twitter, saying the paper was wrong because they didn't consider that greenhouse gases in the atmosphere would soon be declining as human emissions decrease and the ocean and atmosphere absorb the human-made increase of greenhouse gases. <laughs> we hope that even the non-scientists can see through this thinking. Okay, so, you know, and this is a very uh, important graph that's, that's updated. It shows the forcings, the for change in forcing in watts per square meter per year. Okay, how it was, you know, very high here. Um, you know, how, how basically the different RCP, representative concentration pathways, 8.5, 2.6, and, you know, the gaps and so on. It's, it's a very key uh, paper. Uh, I like what he says about here. Twittering can be fun. Perhaps there's merit in Twittering things that build up a large number of followers and help sell books that might help inform the public. But the information needs to be valid if it's to be useful. Um, we hope that there is also support for an approach that focuses on advancing the science, which necessarily means avoiding getting caught up in Twitter banter. So he's, he's, uh, he was complaining that too many scientists are getting involved too much in Twitter banter and not doing their re not advancing the, the research. Okay. So very interesting, um, thoughts and paper. This was uh, another update from him on global temperature in 2022, right? And this is relative to the 1951 to 1980 climatology. And you can see the warming distribution on the planet, how quickly the pole, the, the, Arc, the North Pole is warming. 2020 was the warmest uh, year with this distribution. This is what we had in 2022. So fifth warmest even with the strong La Nina's uh, cooling this whole region here. Okay so global surface temperature in 2022 was plus 1.16 degrees celsius relative to 1880 to 20, 1920. So if you add 0.2 or 0.3 to this right you get 1.36 to 1.46 you're already close to 1.5. Um, and, uh, this was, uh, relative to 1880 to 1920. Um, and these are the rank of the 10 warmest years in the instrumental record. Um, so 2022 here, 1.16, 2020 was 1.29, the warmest. 2016, very strong El Nino, 1.28, second place. 2019, 2020, you know, very warm, 20, first place and third place. 2017 was part of the, this El Nino here, you know, and then 2018 was another El Nino. 
or not 2018. Um, was it another El Nino? But anyway, you can see they're all, you know, they're all recent years, the 10, 10 warmest years. So what he's saying is that 2023 should be notably warmer than 2022 and global temperature in 2024 is likely to reach the 1.4 to 1.5 degrees Celsius as our first Faustian payment of approximately plus 0 0.15 degrees C is due. This plus 0.15 is because of the reduction of aerosols. Okay, so he's talking about relative, so these are relative to 1880 to 1920. So we can expect 2024 to reach between 1.4 and 1.5 Celsius relative to 1880 to 1920. So if you bring it back to 1750, that would be, you add 0.2 to 0.3, bring it from 1.6 to 1.7 or 1.7 to 1.8 degrees Celsius, well over the 1.5. And again, this is the, um, this is the curve. This is the 0 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade rise, but more. But it looks like since 2010, the rise is much steeper. Okay, and he shows the Earth energy imbalance again. Um, you know, he's emphasizing it, and he's talking about the ENSO, the El Nino, uh, coming up, and. Uh, yeah, he talks about a global, uh, the global temperature lag. So we have a peak of the El Nino and then the global temperature peaks uh, with a lag uh, to the next year typically, okay? So, um, so that's why he's saying that, uh, you know, that we're likely to, you know, get, get 0 0.0, 0 0.15 degrees Celsius increase because of the aerosols. And then add that, add the, the 0 0.2, 0 0.3 for the El Nino, you know, and we're going to be, you know, we're very likely to pass this 1.4 to 1.5, um, you know, temperature in 2024 relative to 1880 to 1920. Okay, very significant, um, very significant uh, findings. And then uh, he talked about uh, a little bit about the Cenozoic. So that's the period from, from present day. This is millions of years before present, back to 66 million years ago or so, and all the different temperatures. So this spike was the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. This is the early Eocene climate optimum. Um, this is where the, the OI marks the transition to a glaciated Antarctica, right here. Miocene climate optimum, North Atlantis, Atlantic Igneous Province, so a lot of volcanism. Um, and uh, so he talks about, uh, so looking at the whole Cenozoic, so these are the additions that were made to the 48-page paper to bring it up to 62 pages for the paper Global Warming in the Pipeline. Okay, so he added a section on the Cenozoic, which is now perhaps the most informative part of the paper. So the present greenhouse gas for forcing is 70% of the forcing that made Earth's temperature in the early Eocene climate optimum, at least plus 13 Celsius relative to pre-industrial temperature. Okay, so he's saying that the forcing that we have today, that four watts per square meter, is 70% of the forcing that brought the temperature up this high in the early Eocene climate optimum. Okay, he said the analysis is very simple. The details are in the global warming in the pipeline, so I'll be talking about them in detail. But basically, the a simplification of the analysis is that there's 60 meters of sea level in the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets between today and an ice-free planet. Okay, so if we lose the ice on Greenland and Antarctica, sea levels go up 60 meters. Uh, we already gained 60 meters between today and the last glacial maximum. And the last glacial maximum was actually more like minus six degrees Celsius temperatures relative to now than, than previously thought, minus 3.5. So all of these things um, give you this sort of thing. So this is the 
forcing in watts per square meter. Here's where we are in 2022, 4.1 or 4.2 watts per square meter. The early Eocene climate optimum had a forcing here of 6.5. So we're 70% there. Okay, so that's the key finding. And uh, this is, uh, uh, this just came out um, today, actually. Uh, yeah, this just came out uh, earlier today. You know, is equilibrium warming the same thing as committed warming? Right, so some people on Twitter interpreted the statement in the paper, equilibrium global warming, including slow feedbacks for today's human-made greenhouse gas climate forcing, which is 4.1 watts per square meter, is 10 degrees Celsius, reduced to 8 degrees Celsius by today's aerosols. So the original thing said 6 to 7. Aerosols would reduce it to 6 to 7, but it's more like 8. Okay, so that doesn't mean that the world is committed to warming. Equilibrium warming is not the same thing as committed warming. Okay, it's a useful concept employed for more than a century. So it was, you know, in the studies by Arrhenius in the 1890s, by Charney in the 1970s. It's the global temperature change after the climate system restores energy balance following the imposition of a climate forcing. So one merit of the analysis of the Cenozoic, which is the past 66 million years climate, is that it reveals that the present human-made greenhouse gas forcing is already greater than the greenhouse gas forcing at the transition from a nearly unglaciated Antarctica to a glaciated continent. Okay, yes, if we leave atmospheric composition as it is today, sea level will eventually rise about 60 meters, which is 200 feet. Of course, none of us would be there to see it. However, it's not the new equilibrium at 200 feet that's of most concern. It's the chaos that ensues once ice sheet collapse begins in earnest. Okay, and that chaos was the topic of their paper, Ice Melt, Sea Level Rise, and Superstorms, which was a year or two ago, and it was blackballed by the IPCC, so they didn't include it in their, in their uh, reports. But in that paper, it concluded that the continuation of greenhouse gas emissions along the path that the world is on will lead to shutdown of the, of the AMOC, the, the overturning uh, circulation, the AMOC, the North Atlantic one, and the Southern Ocean one this century, and sea level rise of several meters will occur on a time scale of 50 to 150 years. So there you go. You know, as yet, little has changed to get us off that path. Okay, and then I like this. Physics is a description of the real world. So climate science should be focused on data. That's the way science is supposed to work. However, the IPCC is focused on models, not just GCMs, global climate models, but models that feed the models. For example, integrated assessment models using many models integrated that provide scenarios for future greenhouse levels. So you have a model to show where you think greenhouse levels are going, and then you plug it into another model, another model, right? These models are useful, even necessary for analysis of the complex climate system, but sometimes the models contain hocus pocus. As we mentioned in our current paper, they can assume an effect that a miracle will occur. So the models need to be continually checked against the real world. So here's here's the gist of it. Here's here's what's happening. This is the best linear fit, 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade. This is temperature anomaly over time, but this is where we're we are right now. Accelerated warming with reduction of aerosols. Okay, um, and <laughs> there's no time to get involved in Twitter wars. It's disappointing that scientists who once contributed to research progress but now enjoy twittering do not, it should be tweeting, right? Twittering <laughs> is his word. Do not correct a non-scientist assumption that equilibrium warming equals committed warming, but instead allow the misconception to persist and then use it to insist that we are wrong in our assessment. Okay, so yeah, so then they talk about this this paper. So you know, we're really looking at 1.4, 1.5 Celsius in the next few years. 
okay but you know we'll reach that and then it uh, you know it doesn't mean that the trend line is reaching 1.5 but that normally follows within a couple of years of actually first crossing it what it means is that we're going to get a spike you know here's 1.5 here it means within a few years we're going to get one of these spikes uh, from the El Nino that passes 1.5 okay uh, that's what it looks like Okay, so, um, right, so I've shown a number of the key figures in this, in the paper being discussed, etc. But my next uh, number of videos, I don't know how many, will be focused on dissecting this 62 page paper, Global Warming in the Pipeline. So, your homework uh, from this video is uh, go to James Hansen's. Uh, website or just google global warming in the pipeline download this paper to your um, computer and uh, start having a look read the abstract read the conclusions look at the figures okay you can just scroll down and see okay there's a figure what does that mean try to understand the figures okay uh, but i will be discussing it in great detail in my next uh, number of videos. So thanks for listening and uh, bye for now.